Hello. Today's scripture passage is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, and it reads, John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. There you have John the Baptist telling the people something that they needed to know. Jesus is on the way. And for us too, Christmas is coming, that day where we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And it's a date on the calendar that seemed far distant in the future, far off, but now It's nearly upon us. We are but weeks away. Or do we still have some waiting to do? It's a week and some days away from where I am now sitting. But just how long is that really? For my daughter and for my all three of my children, really, it seems like an eternity. But my eldest talks about how long it seems until Christmas. But for the parents, it feels like it's just barreling down upon us. And at this point, I just want to be clear, I'm only speaking of the civic and commercial holiday. Here in church, it is essential that we remember what it's all about. And I don't mean some quaint reflection about Jesus being the reason for the season. He is, but there's more here than simply remembering the birthday of our Savior. We remember because of what the coming means, what His coming means. This is why we light candles, candles of hope, peace, joy, and love. And then, on Christmas Eve, the Christ candle. And these are all meant to be reminders that His coming means that we can hold fast to hope because peace, love, and the resulting joy is so close we can taste it. At least that's the idea. That's the hope. And what is often forgotten is that the coming of Christ into the world has implications here and now. Beyond all the consumerism and remembering Jesus' birthday, the coming has implications. We mean by that that when Jesus came, so did the realm of God. In other words, Christmas is already here. I know it's hard to believe that God's realm has come in a world that remains largely untransformed, but that's our claim. We feel a bit silly, maybe I feel a bit silly, sometimes proclaiming that the Prince of Peace is here when the statistics show that this year saw a dramatic peak in violence in the United States. 
not to mention the global conflicts that seem never ending, not to mention the pandemic that we are still in the throes of. It's hard to believe that there are reasons to hope when so many find themselves entrenched in hopeless situations and so far removed from peace and joy and even love. So it's pretty easy for some of us to mock the faux, giddy joyousness of our Christmas hymns because sometimes, and here I must be honest, because sometimes, for me anyway, the joy is forced. And what of love? I I know that's the next candle that we'll light in the next week of Advent, but phrases like all you need is love seem less profound with the passing of every year. After all, people have been saying it for years, and where has it gotten us? Joy to the world, blah, blah, blah. So what to do? Well, I'll tell you what many of us have done. We've heard the message of Christmas of hope, peace, joy, and love, and have concluded that in reality, these things still remain far off in the distance, or maybe that they aren't coming for us at all. True, Christmas may be coming closer in a technical sense, as in the day the 25th of December is fast approaching, but the time when God will really break in and change things is still somewhere far over the horizon from many perspectives. In the meantime, let's just bury our heads or purchase more commodities and wait for God to come and do all the heavy lifting. But that's not the claim, is it? We claim that Jesus came, that the realm of God came with him, that the Prince of Peace has arrived, and that help is not only on the way, but has come. And that means something. It has profound implications. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a manger. Shepherds worshipped. Dignitaries brought extravagant gifts. And if Jesus came, then so did the realm of God into this world along with its transformative potential. So, for John the Baptist in our text today, the question becomes, will you allow your baptism to amount to anything? This is the question that John has on his mind as he is being approached by the crowd to be baptized. The text reads, John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Can you imagine it? Me or some other pastor saying something like that, Somebody comes forward to be baptized, and then the pastor responds, you brood of vipers. But the next line is telling, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Baptism for this crowd seems to be an escape. It's a safety net. It's soul insurance. And for this crowd, it comes with very few obligations or expectations. And this is why John is upset. Sign on the dotted line, keep your receipt, write the date down in your Bible when you were saved. What next? Wait for the end or whatever comes next. So John gets angry at the crowd because they fail to understand that their baptism does not mark an escape from the troubles of this world. They are not coming to sign up for some form of celestial life insurance. Rather, their baptism marks the entrance into a new relationship with God, one that calls us to a life that is at once transformative and difficult. The yoke is easy and the burden is light, but it is still a yoke. Sometimes it's more. For didn't Jesus say, That to follow him is to take up a cross? In other words, it can be like going to die. So, people come to be baptized, and John makes sure that they understand what's at stake. Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? My translation, this will be hard. There's no fleeing the wrath. So, in the meantime, what's the answer? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Bear fruit. Fruit means action. Good, godly, 
deeds and actions. So get moving, says John. Don't cash in on your spiritual heritage as if what your ancestors did is a cover for you. Your spiritual heritage tells you the story of your spiritual forebearers. So learn from them. True, learn from them. But take up their mantle yourselves. John goes on to use an analogy of an axe lying at the foot of the tree. Those that don't bear fruit will be cut down. In other words, it's time for you to decide. It's as if John is sitting in the driver's seat saying to someone waiting by the curbside, get in or stay put. The time for action is now. This train's moving with or without you. The realm of God cannot be stopped. The call to discipleship is always this urgent because so much is at stake. It's time for us to decide today. Well, the crowd listens to John's admonition, and then they ask a logical question. Well, what should we do? What then should we do? And here is the advice for the common folk, people like you and me. This is what John said. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. There is more than enough in the world, in other words, if we can share it. If there are those who lack, the problem is not with the creator. It's with the stewards of this creation. The problem is with you and with me. So what can you do? I love this very simple and practical advice that John gives, starting with just coats as an example. Share what you have with those who need it. Basically, Anyone can follow this precept. You can take baby steps or gargantuan leaps if you have enough. But either way, you can do it. And when you do it, the realm of God comes closer. Christmas arrives. While we're waiting for Christmas, where is it? The kids are waiting for that specific day, but those of us whose hearts are broken look for the meaning of Christmas to come alive around us. When you do this, it comes. The meantime, in the meantime, when we feed the hungry, when we clothe the poor, we bring healing into our communities as best as we can. Food pantries and homeless shelters all over the world are microcosms of Christmas, little pockets of Christmas where the realm of God lives in real time. Christmas may be coming on December 25th, but at the Salvation Army, it comes again and again. At our food pantry on Saturdays again and again, the realm of God arrives. Christmas is here. And this is the important point. Many are waiting for the realm of God to come in fullness. They're waiting on Christmas. And by the way, so am I. But in the meantime, we are invited to participate in the realm of God that is already here. The miracle stories, the healing stories, the feeding of the 5,000, and the raising of Lazarus, these are all part of the gospel narratives to demonstrate that the power of God is breaking into our lives in the here and now. When Jesus Christ came into the world, it arrived. He brought it with him. So what are we waiting on? But at the same time, it isn't easy. It's no wonder that those in John's day were trying to escape the wrath, and it isn't easy. I am too. But we were warned. Generations before us have lived faithfully, and now it's our turn. John invites all to join in this tradition. We are invited to bring Christmas still closer in our own time, and it gets better. Some tax collectors and soldiers who were present, people who were really part of the problem in those days, well, they ask the same question that people ask, what shall we do? They ask this question from a place of power and privilege. Tax collectors worked with Rome to collect money for Rome's projects and for Rome's army, and the soldiers would have been a Gentile class whose job it was to make sure the people of Israel stayed docile and in their proper place. So for most every Jew, this meant that they paid to support the very system that kept them entrenched in the poverty and in the despair. So just after the people who are entrenched in that poverty say, what should we do? Now their oppressors are asking the same questions. But John doesn't tell the oppressor class to get lost. I would have. John doesn't. 
Instead, they are invited to bring closer as well, to walk into that life, to enter into this life. Notice they aren't told to quit their jobs. The tax collector isn't asked to renounce his position of influence. The soldier isn't encouraged to go AWOL. No, they are instead told to do their job in a just and fair way. Redeem the job. The tax collector is told not to take any more than they are required. The soldier is told not to extort the populace for profit. If John were living today, he might tell the banking class or the corporate classes to stop lobbying for unjust tax breaks whilst saddling the common folk with the tab. He might encourage our armed forces and their governing bodies to focus on white-collar crime instead of crime in the poorest communities. Either way, there is something for us all to do, whatever our status or class. The people responded accordingly to John's message. The text reads, as the people were filled with expectation, And I got to say, as an aside, in the season of Advent, it is easier for us to understand this feeling. For we too sense that Christmas is coming closer, and we do so with a sense of expectancy. Well, it goes on. And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. Another aside, sometimes it's so close that it seems that it has come in full. These moments are rare, but they do occur. Those moments when you can truthfully say, it is here. God is here. The realm of God is here. Love is here. All is for once well. For once, all is well. John answered all of them and their questions with this concluding statement. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In other words, when it comes in full, it will be far better than even this, which is hard to fathom in those moments when Christmas has come so very close. When I am surrounded by those I love in life, especially when they are happy, fed, warm, and laughing, I sometimes wonder if it can get any better. And John's answer is, yes. One is coming who will bring it all home. The best is yet to come. Then uses another analogy that the people would understand, saying his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. These last lines are classic calls to repentance. They are meant to build up in us a sense of even more urgency. Hurry, because we don't have all the time in the world. We all die. Life lived that does not bear fruit fades away like the chaff. When someone dies who has not brought Christmas closer, the wealth and status are left behind. We all know this. They thought that they were the sum of their possessions and put their faith in what moth and rust destroys, and so it goes. But we are given another way. Christmas. Enter into the life Jesus brings. Christmas is coming closer, but it comes closer still in every season of the year when we ourselves bear fruit, when we give of ourselves or possessions. Everything for the life of the world. Our repentance and our baptism calls us to be for others what Jesus has been for the world. So make sacrifices. Rearrange your life and priorities and the realm of God comes near. And you experience the joy and you share the joy with others. Lose your life to find it, as Jesus said. Bear fruit. Fruit has seeds. And fruit in turn becomes new life. Christmas 
comes closer and closer still. It looks like the earliest Christian communities for whom Christmas came so close that no one had any need. Read about it. That's the dream. How close will Christmas come to you this year and in every year and in all those days in between? I hope this year we can say to one another with conviction, Christ the Savior is born. The realm of God has come. In fact, it has arrived.